Father God, we want to thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. Father, thank you that we've just been encouraged this morning to fix our eyes firmly on Jesus and to, to say no to a whole lot of other stuff, a whole lot of other things which might choose to distract us and choose to have our attention. And so we ask, Father, as we come now under your word, pray, Lord, that you might help us to have our eyes firm, firmly fixed on Jesus. Father, bless our time together, we ask in his precious name. Amen. I know what you've done here. You've placed Glenda up here, so I can't move this down there. No, that's all right. Our reading this morning is from 2 Kings, chapter 18, verses 1 to 4. Um, it introduces Hezekiah's rule. Uh, we're going to use it as a springboard into our topic this morning. So we're going to, it'll be quite topical. Our sermon this morning won't be an exposition of scripture. Um, Hezekiah comes to rule after his father, Ahaz. Ahaz was not a good king. God judges Ahaz's rule uh, two chapters earlier where he says this, he followed, that is Ahaz, followed the ways of the kings of Israel and even sacrificed his son in the fire, engaging in the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. He offered sacrifices and burned incense at the high places, on the hilltops and under every spreading tree. Hezekiah did not have a good role model. Not only does Ahaz do all these detestable things, but he encourages the people of Judah to do them as well. But not all the evil that Ahaz does came from his imagination. Some, like the worship at high places, was happening in Judah a long time before Ahaz was king. So, uh, our text today, 2 Kings 18, 1-4 says this. In the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. He removed the high places, smashed the sacred stones and cut down the Asherah poles. He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made, for up to that time the Israelites had been burning incense to it. It was called Nehushtan. Bet you didn't know that. So why pick this text? Why talk about this today? Last week's prayer, brought to us by Tim Underwood, talked about idols. Idols in our life. <coughs> and I can let you know that this is a question and a point of prayer for the elders as well. As we've looked, about this, looked at this in the life of our church. But it's a personal thing first. If we cannot or will not see idols in our own life, we will not be able to see them in the life of the church either. That said, we do not, as humans, have a very strong ability to spot faults in our life. Jesus tells a funny story about having taken care of the log in your own eye before you look at the speck in another's. But often we don't think that story is very funny. But it is. We're going to drill a little deeper into Tim's question and his prayer this morning. By defining our terms a little bit, so we might understand what we mean by idols and how a good thing can become a God thing, then we want to determine what identifies an idol before talking about how we might destroy them. So, definition, determination, destruction. Three-point sermon. Fantastic. Rarely happens. All right. Definition. 
idols are infuriating in as much as we have this natural ability to create them out of almost anything. 16th century reformer John Calvin famously said that the hearts of people are idol-making factories. No sooner do we identify one and crush it than we make another to put in its place. But what do we mean by an idol? Timothy Keller says, anything we look to more than we look to Christ for our sense of acceptability, joy, significance, hope and security is by definition our God. Something we adore, serve and rely on with our whole life and heart. In general, idols can be good things. Family, achievement, work and career, romance, talent, etc. Even gospel ministry. Good things that we can turn into ultimate things to give us the significance and joy we need. One of Martin Luther's insights is that we never commit a sin, we never, we never break one of God's commandments without breaking the first one first. We don't lie, commit adultery or steal unless we first make something more fundamental to our hope, our joy and our identity than God. While in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, Idols had to do with statues, small or large. The reference with that reference gods that were always small. In our time and in our days, idols are different. In the past, there were creations of moral ambiguity or selfish, arbitrary power. But now they're more subtle. Often they come in the form of something good. And that change from something good to something idolatrous is what our passage is about today. We know the story about how the bronze snake came to be, don't we? We know how, about the rebellion that caused the venomous snake to, snakes to appear in the, um, in the Israelite camp and come and bite them. Just a few weeks ago, we talked about how God told Moses to forge a bronze serpent put it on a pole and lift the pole high so that everyone who was bitten, when they looked at it, at that bronze serpent, they would be healed. And we saw how Jesus used that to point to himself. We might have wandered at that stage, and, uh, drifted away during the sermon. We may have thought, I wonder what happened to that bronze serpent on a pole. I wonder... If they put it in storage somewhere, maybe they had you store it there on the way. They carried it around with them through the wilderness, the tabernacle. Maybe when they built the temple, they had a storeroom and they put it in. The big pole, the bronze serpent. What happened to that good thing? Our passage tells us what happened to that good thing, doesn't it? The people of Judah had brought it into their religious observance. They had taken the tool of God created so that people who exercised faith in it would be saved. And they made it a God thing. Something they put in place of God. What had been a good thing had now become a God thing. It had now become an idol. And what happens in the physical in the Old Testament so often becomes spiritual in the new and beyond into our day. A great example of this has to do with the gifts God gives us. In the Old Testament, as the Israelites left Egypt, they plundered the nation. God had asked them to ask their neighbours for items of gold and silver and precious things. And these gifts were meant to be used by the Israelites to build and furnish the tabernacle in the wilderness. But what happened to all of those bright, shiny things? Exodus 32, 1-4 tells us what happened to some of them. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. 
As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we do not know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they had handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. The very gifts from God to be used for his glory had now become the object they worshipped instead of him. So idolatry, do you see that? Do you see how God gave them these things? Then they forged them and make them an idol. So easy. Idolatry is a really, really big thing. But what makes it harder for us to see is that often our idols are good things. When an idol is made of a good thing, we need some sort of revelation for us because we find it really hard. We become blind to the possibilities. It's hard to see beyond the log in our eye. I know that I'm not alone when I say that I never really see the subtle sins in my life as really sinful. We become insensitive to them. Lately I've been often reminded of the maxim, what the heart desires, the will chooses and the mind justifies. But we might want to add something about our emotions to that as well, because nowadays it's our emotions which drive so much of our decision making, isn't it? You look at the media, you look at the marketing, it's all about targeting our emotion, targeting our feelings. Tim Keller rewrites the maxim. He says, what the, heart find, what the heart most wants, the mind finds reasonable, the emotions find valuable, and the will finds doable. What the heart most wants, the mind finds reasonable, the emotions find valuable, and the will finds doable. Just imagine, hey, we know this, it plays out all the time, doesn't it? Young love, young love, you know, my children, my children, you try and get them to do anything at home. You know, do the dishes, please, do the dishes. Your mum should not be doing the dishes for you. And it's like, can you cook a meal, <coughs> one meal a week, that would be lovely, it would be really good. Can you do washing? Can you wash your clothes? And while they're at home, they say, I don't have time. I've got study to do. I've got work to do. I've got, I don't have time to do all this stuff until they find love. And then they have time to spend with them all the time. They can do their study. They can do their work. They can do all of it. And they can still spend half their life there. They, what the heart most wants, the mind finds reasonable, the emotions find valuable, and the will finds doable. Yeah? And then when they get married, when they get married, their wife says, thank you for teaching your child to cook, to clean, <laughs> to do the washing. Thank you so much. So we understand something about what the, an idol is. For us and the possibilities presented for us that might be so but how do we determine what it is in our life how do we know we have idols in our life how do we know we have idols in our church we don't have statues anywhere we don't even have wall hangings we have them rolled up and put inside the cupboard we don't know that how do we know? Luther's insight is helpful here. Idolatry is always behind sin. It's always identified with sin in our life. I know that while on occasion we might think that we are sinful, like we say all people sin, 
on that general category, but we do not often think of ourselves, our subtle sin, in those same terms. We might think of them as a mistake or just a flaw in our character. But it's important to see that behind even those sins is an idol, perhaps even more so. Timothy Keller suggests four roots for idols in our lives. Power, control, comfort and approval. You know, if we want to chase back our behaviours, so run them back, and if we can see in them a desire to have power over something or a need to take control in something, a craving to gain comfort from something, or a desire to get approval from someone, or things to that effect, then the object we have placed our trust in to give us that has become an idol in our life. And do you know what? We rarely stop at one. It's really interesting, you read the Old Testament, and idols pop up all over the place. Um, Jacob. Jacob married to, he wants to marry Rachel. Remember the story? Remember the story. Please, I haven't got time to tell you the whole story. Jacob wants to marry Rachel. He gets tricked into marrying Rachel's sister, Leah. But then, after seven more years, he can marry Rachel. So he's worked seven years for Rachel in the first place, but got Leah instead. Couldn't trade her in. Had to work another seven years. So then he has two wives. And then they have some children, and then he says, I'm going to go. So in the middle of the night, he packs up all of his family, all of his kids, all of his stuff, all of his goats, all of his speckled sheep, and off he goes. Yeah? Off he goes. But Rachel, the wife who he's loved, has taken... Now we know Jacob. Jacob's a God-fearing man, is he not? He's had visions from God. Yeah? Laid down, had a dream about ladders going from heaven. And he's the son of the promise, is he not? This where he's Rachel, the love of his life. Well, she's brought the household household idols with her. And, and off they go with them. Laban, her brother, comes and chases them looking for the idols, doesn't care so much about the people, but he's after the idols. Idols pop up everywhere. David, when he's fighting, when he's uh, running away from Saul, Saul tries to pin him to a wall with a spear, and David escapes, and he runs back home. And the next day he's meant to go to Saul's house for dinner, and he doesn't arrive. And, and Saul sends some guards, and his wife tells the guards, oh no, David's sick in bed. But what they've done, they've taken the household idol, David the man after God's own heart, had a household idol and put it in bed to pretend it's David. So they would think he was sick, so he couldn't go. So David could escape out the window to Saul, uh, to, to Samuel. Idols pop up everywhere. If they pop up everywhere in the Old Testament like that, they pop up everywhere in your life too. We just need to scratch a little to find them. Murray Cappell, based on a book by Paul Tripp, writes in a similar vein to uh, Timothy Keller. He said, we need to understand that idols always demand sacrifices. Idols take time, money, focus and attention. As we serve our idol, we cheat God. If money has become our idol, we accumulate wealth and spend lots of time and energy thinking about how to gain it and how to spend our money. Instead of how to invest in the work of the gospel. If entertainment is our God, we spend far too much time watching movies, listening to music and surfing the internet and far too little time with God. 
If image is our God, we spend far too much time and focus on how other people perceive us and what they think of us, and far too little time focused on what God thinks of us. Tripp says idolatry is therefore always moral thievery. It takes from what is rightfully God's and gives it to someone or something else. Perhaps the biggest place for idolatry in our world, in our time, is in respect to identity. People everywhere trying to find out who they are with respect to their sexual identity, their gender identity, their personal identity, political identity, and even national identity. While having an identity is an important and valuable thing, it is not a thing we should seek or try to understand outside of Christ Jesus. Our identity is rooted in Him. Colossians 1.15 tells us that the Son, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. And we know that every person is made in the image of God. While identity is always personal, it's never individually gained. Identity is never found by an individual. We don't stumble across identity. It's always something given to us either directly or indirectly by God, or directly or indirectly by another agent whose sole desire is the ruin of a person. And if we don't believe that's true, we don't have to go very far in the Scriptures to find it. Take Adam and Eve, for instance. I think they appear on page 3, <laughs> this story, very early. God's already given to them his creation, Adam and Eve, the pinnacle of his creation, all the identity markers they will ever need. But then another comes, a liar who is the father of all lies, who says, God is not to be trusted. This is a paraphrase. It's not out of a message. This is even worse. This is my paraphrase. God is not to be trusted. In fact, the deceiver goes on, the identity has, he has given you is not what you could be. You could be as God himself. So rather than retain the identity they have been given, Eve and Adam discarded for the other one they were offered. <clears throat> and what about idolatry in the church or idolatry by the church? Clearly, much of what we have said holds true. But the subtlety is even craftier. In a lot of ways, idolatry in a corporate sense or in a church sense today is the worship of the gift rather than the giver. On point here can be our attitude to worship. And I don't point fingers here. I've this has been running around in my head for over two years. There's a note on my phone written in May 2020 that was very thin. Worship is a gift to us. How we worship today is a gift to us. The way in which we worship, how it involves a whole person now, is beautiful. In past times, we had choirs who sang. Or we have songs that may have had much theological strength, but they were impossible to sing. Or the melodies were not pleasing to anyone's ears. It was a challenge. Now our worship songs are sung by all, by everyone. They often involve our emotions, our minds, and even our bodies when we stand, raise our hands or, or clap. And yet, despite this wonderful gift, I've had reason to question in my own heart and in our hearts if this thing we do on a Sunday morning, this singing, is for us what it should be. Do we come to worship God or do we come for what worshipping God gives us? Do we come to respect and appreciate God and to let him know that we love him 
and are amazed by him? Or do we come so that in the singing we might have an experience? An experience that is emotional that we suggest means God is here. While well, both might happen, only one can be at the centre of our heart. We can't have both at the centre. And when we come together, when we choose our songs, when we order our coming together, when the worship leader plans and executes their thing, when the prayer leader plans and executes their thing, when the preacher plans and executes their thing, whose glory, whose honour, whose approval do they see? Are we trying to get an experience? It's not just an individual thing connected to individual people or individual ministers. It's far more cultural than that. I need to be open with you. You need to know where my head's at, where my heart is at. As I'm thinking about this with respect to the church, I'm reminded of, in two short passages of what it means should a church be worshipping the gift rather than the giver. If they're engaged in idolatry. And those two passages fill me with fear. The first comes from Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. To the angel of the church in Ephesus writes, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people and that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have, pres- you have persevered and have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. The second is from 2 Timothy 3 verses 1 to 5. Yeah, that's a scary passage, isn't it? The one the, from Revelation. That is scary. If you don't come back to your first love, I will remove the spirit, the, the lampstand, from its place. That is a scary thing. 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 5. But mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of... Just think about the 21st century. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Is that the one the world around us? But listen to how he finishes this having a form of godliness, but denying its power. He's talking not about the world out there, he's talking about the church in here. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. They fill me with dread, these passages. Because we're not as fruitful as God would have it. I was talking to someone the other day. Lamenting we were, there has not been a salvation here for a long time. A year is a long time. A decade is an eternity. Perhaps it's like that because we have in the past or even today been about stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff like worship, like prayer, like teaching. But we've made them ultimate things. Things that if we do them, we will be fruitful. We'll see what God wants in the city. Things that if we do them and do them well, we'll manipulate God 
to make us fruitful. And that thinking, that mindset has more to do with witchcraft than it has to do with God and the people of God. More to do with that than people loving Jesus. Don't get me wrong, we should do those things. They are good things. We should seek to do them well. But they are not ultimate things. Sometimes we say, look at our prayer ministry. How good is that? We pray here for 24 hours. But I'm going prayer meetings here. Well, come, be at our worship. What an experience we have. All the churches, we come together, we hire out middle back theatre, and we all worship together. What an experience that is. God must be in the house. Or isn't he a great teacher? Or aren't we really great at connecting with the community? Isn't that what Banyara is known for? How it connects with the community around Wayala? And I know we've done these things. Because if I had a dollar for every time I heard a hankering for the good old days, I'd be a very rich man. We have idolised them. And when we develop those good things that may have become God things, we care as much about corporate and personal holiness as we should, without which no one can see God. And so, I've wondered, have I had, have we had a form of godliness that denied its power? Have I had, have we, have we had a form of love for Jesus but has denied him as our first love? Idols are serious serious business. God will not share his glory with another. He will not share his worship with another. They are serious business. They cannot share the throne together. There's only room for one. God will not. So, we've found them. We've identified them. We've stirred up in our hearts today. How do we get rid of it? Destruction. What do we do about them? The good news is that turning from idols to God is something the gospel enables us to do. Paul writes to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 4, 10, uh, 1 Thessalonians 1, 4 to 10, he writes this. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you. Not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of God. But you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave, you gave us. They tell how you turn from God to idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Through the Gospel, they turn to God, from idols. Turning from idols to serve the living God causes change in people. The gospel causes change in people. In the days of the Old Testament and in the New Testament, grinding up statues or burning books was a great way to show how you've turned from an idol to God. But when the idol is a good thing that's become a God thing, say a family, it's not great to grind your family up or burn them in fire. That's frowned upon nowadays. But idolatry, as the root of sin, is dealt with like sin. 
five steps. Revelation, conviction, repentance, confession, and obedience. Revelation. I want you to notice something about all of this. Revelation. God, by His grace, shows us our sin, both as individuals and as a church. He shows us through His Word, through His Holy Spirit, through another person, through an enemy. The revelation is firstly to our mind or to our emotion. They're the doors into our heart. Either we feel it's not right or we have reason for it to be wrong. Conviction. God, by His grace, uses the revelation to bring to us heart conviction. So that the heart wants to change, to rid ourselves of the idol and the sin and, and the sin that it spawns. There's no use in understanding with our mind alone that we have an idol with food because it provides comfort or with money because it provides control. We need to know that if we find comfort outside of Christ Jesus, we have made food our idol. Or if we have wrested control from the sovereign love of God, we have created an idol out of our money. That conviction comes through the Holy Spirit alone. Thirdly, repentance. God, by His grace, gives us the gift of repentance as a response to that holy conviction. Through revelation and conviction, we turn towards Jesus. We always turn towards Jesus. And that's what we do when we repent, isn't it? We turn to Jesus. We turn away from doing our own thing. We turn away from our idol. And we turn to Jesus. We turn and move to Him. Confession. God, by His grace, faces confession as a fruit of repentance. We might remember John the Baptist used to tell people who came for baptism, for repentance, he used to tell them, he used to tell them, show me the fruit of your repentance. Show God the fruit of your repentance. Our confession is both to the sinfulness of idolatry and the behaviours it's created in us, and also a confession of the completeness of who Christ is, of his, of his forgiveness and his power over all. So our confession is both of our sinfulness and of our forgiveness in Christ and in Christ alone. And that confession is to God, who promises to forgive us, is faithful and true to that promise. But our confession should also be to a person. It's what makes us real and gives us responsibility. You ever wonder why they have things like 12 step programs for alcoholics? <laughs> because they work. <laughs> It's a weird thing because part of these four steps, the first one is to acknowledge the power greater than you, to acknowledge God. Part of that role is to connect with people and make yourself accountable and responsible to people through confession. I wonder where they got the idea from. They come out of the Talbot's cornflakes packet. Come from the Word of God. The only issue is who do you confess to? Certainly it has to be someone you trust, who will not hold it against you, who will love you and pray for you. And finally, obedience. God, by His grace, then empowers us to say no to that ungodliness by the presence of His indwelling Holy Spirit. Obedience to God is prioritising our relationship with Him and that is the heart of obedience, prioritising our relationship with God. Loving Jesus, pursuing holiness, and doing what Jesus said are obviously what obedience is all about. Friends, I've kept you for a long time. 
but not anywhere near as long as we've been content to allow idols to erode our relationship with the king of the kingdom of God. If you if you felt stirred up in your heart, if you feel that actually this is something I need to pursue, then I encourage you, I encourage you, come we'll pray about it together. Come, we will seek God together. Because we just can't let it continue. We can't let it continue. If you feel stirred up in your heart, do something about it. So long as you're not a musician, not letting your shit singing. Because we need you to play the guitar. But, Just let it go. Even if you just feel guilty, do something about it. Come to the cross. And come and sing this last one. Come, that, come and sing it. And that, I want to let you close us in prayer today. But I'm not going to pray. I'm just going to.